All right. Now we're going to get into the diptera, which, as you may know, is one of the more important orders when it comes to veterinary entomology. So the diptera, these, if you remember back to insect systematics, are commonly known as the true flies. Remember, di means two, terra means wings. They have two true wings, and these are the true flies. And we call them true flies because we're differentiating them from the, uh, say, butterflies or other sorts of things that have fly in it, dragonflies, right? So these are actually flies. Now, literally means two-winged. Uh, they've got that first pair of wings on their mesothorax that is nice and big and allows them to fly. And then they have that hind pair of wings that is greatly modified and reduced. Those are reduced into the haltiers, those little tiny knob-like organs that allow for the uh, flies to orient themselves in space. Now, this is one of the largest and most diverse orders. So it's really big. It has a whole bunch of evolution going on in there. And there's approximately 120,000 species worldwide. Approximately 20,000 are found here in North America. So that's a decent amount here on this North American continent of that 120,000 all on Earth. So Diptera are considered the most important order when it comes to human and to animal health. Okay, the reason for this is their ability to do things like annoy animals. So they can have this really, really high annoyance in animals. If you've ever been out at a oh, barn or in a pasture and you've seen horse flies all over animals or house flies all over those animals, or if you yourself has been outside and you've had these things flying in your face, you know that they have that high annoyance. But what really makes them incredibly important is their ability to vector disease. So you may have heard this before, but uh, mosquitoes are considered the deadliest animal on earth. This includes other humans. So mosquitoes, because of their vectoring capabilities, kill more people and more animals than any other organism on earth or any other large organism on earth, including humans. Okay, so that's just ridiculous. So they are the deadliest animal on earth because of that vectoring capability. And other fly species can also vector diseases. And we'll go over those that are exceptionally important to animals throughout this next unit or so. Flies also have species that produce myiasis. So that is the feeding on a living organism, feeding on the tissues of a living organism animal, living organism. Okay, so they will feed on those tissues. They might also feed on blood. Uh, they cause a lot of problems because of this. And that is what we're really going to focus on when it comes to the diptera. However, remember that there are quite a few beneficial species in the diptera. We have species that act as pollinators. We have species that act as decomposers. We have species that act as um, biocontrol for really annoying other species of insects. There are also species that will cause myiasis, so feeding on a living organism, but they feed only on the dead flesh or the decomposing flesh. So that allows these uh, maggots or these flies to clean out wounds. And that is exceptionally important. So in today's lesson, I'm just going to give you this overview of the diptera. And then over the next two videos, we'll talk about uh, the different types of things that the, these different diptera can do. Then we'll move into the different families and species of diptera that are exceptionally important to both living and dead animals. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the taxonomy of dips. Uh, the order is divided into two suborders. So remember, back to our basic classification goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. But everything has sub things. So we have you know subclasses and suborders and superclasses and superorders. So the suborder of diptera are the nematocera and the brachycera. So nematocera and brachycera.
The typical Nematocera looks like a mosquito. So we've broken up this order based on two very different looking flies that fall into it. And if you compare the two that are here, we've got a mosquito down on that bottom left and we've got a blowfly up on the top right. They look significantly different, right? So that's why we ended up with these two suborders. So the Nematocera are the mosquito-like organisms. They have these conspicuously long antennae. So if you look at the head region of that uh, Nematocera or that mosquito there, you can see that it's got long antennae. Uh, the larvae are also significantly different. So the larvae range in length from only a few millimeters to many centimeters long, just depending on the species. But they are distinguished from the other suborder, from the Brachycera, by having a conspicuous head capsule. So if you see that mosquito larvae there in the center, notice that it's got that obviously sclerotized capsule. That's the head capsule. So that is the type specimen of the Nematocera. <clears throat> That head capsule will house opposable mandibles. So those mandibles move in a pincher-like movement on a horizontal plane, which allows them to take bites out of things. So that allows them to be predators or to be a generalists when they're feeding. Now, the general body shape of the Nematocerin larvae is they are kind of eel-like, right? So they're elongate, they uh, uh, can be really uh, segmented, or they can be very, very large and fleshy. All right, big thing is they have that uh, specific head capsule or that uh, conspicuous head capsule. Now, the adults have that long filamentous antennae uh, that's composed of six or more segments. So looking at it, you can see six or more distinctive segments in that filiform antennae. And those antennae are usually longer than the head and the thorax combined. So that gives a lot of uh, idea of how big those antennae are in comparison. Now, some groups in this suborder are blood feeders. If you're looking at a mosquito, you know this. Okay, so they are blood feeders. But in the case of Nematocera, it's the females that do the blood feeding. And they usually do this blood feeding through piercing and sucking mouth parts. Okay, so females of the Nematocera are the blood feeders. Now, onto the Brachycera. The Brachycera look like houseflies or blowflies. You got that type specimen in there in the upper right. Okay, so they have much, much shorter antennae. They're really hard to see unless you know exactly where you're looking in the Brachycera. The larvae, which you can see on the bottom right there, they lack that sclerotized head capsule. Notice that that head region is just sort of pointy. Okay, so you've got a blunt posterior region and a pointy head region, no conspicuous head capsule. That makes it easy to tell in the field, Nematocera from Brachycera. Now, as a group, Brachycerin larvae are commonly known as maggots. So think about that when you're thinking about Brachycera. The head area of the maggot usually bears one or two what we call mouth hooks instead of mandibles. These are used for feeding. They're generally retracted internally, and they can be sent forward in order to feed. They're also used for movement. So the maggots will grab onto the substrate with these hooks and pull themselves along when needed. So they're used for both feeding and to assist in movement. The adults. The adults have those short antennae. They're often in the form of aerostate antennae. Now remember back to our basic insect anatomy. Those aerostate antennae have that sort of weird looking lump and then this long arista coming out from it. Okay, so aerostate antennae. Um, and these antennae are conspicuously short. So in the Nematocera, the antennae are longer than the head and the thorax combined. In the Brachycera, they're not even close to the length of the head. Okay, they're very, very tiny. Now, some groups in this suborder are blood feeders. So that isn't exclusive to Nematocera, but the, Brachyc the Brach Brachycerans can feed on blood. But when they feed on blood, they will have those piercing and sucking mouth parts, but both sexes will feed on blood. So we don't just have the females feeding on blood. It's both the males and the females, Brachycera, will feed on blood, while just the female Nematocerans will feed on blood. 
Now, both of these suborders are still in Diptera, so they have that single functional pair of wings that arise from the mesothorax. Right? The hind pair of wings are modified into that knobbed balancing organ known as the halteres. And then wing venation is just highly variable all over them. That's the basic taxonomy of the Diptera. Now, just a quick note on how we identify flies. As we get into this identification, as you're sitting in lab looking at all these different flies, we will start to notice a lot of hairs on the body. Okay? The study of the hairs or study of the CD and the bristles on the body, this is known as ketotaxy. So ketotaxy is the arrangement of the CD and the bristles on an insect body. So CD, these are hairs found all over the insect body. So anytime you're looking into the microscope, you see these little hairs, those we call CD. So these are all over. Now bristles are like CD, but they're bigger and thicker. So both the CD and the bristles are used in identification of insect families and insect species. The hairs are the CD and the bristles. They're inserted into cetal sockets. These are outgrowths of the exoskeleton, that insect exoskeleton. Okay, so they remain as little pockets. What's nice about these cetal sockets is even if the hairs, even if the CD are broken off because the insects have been mishandled or they're old or something like that, those cetal sockets are going to remain. So when you're in lab looking at some of your specimens, even if the hairs aren't present, you can look for the pits, those cetal sockets that the hairs sat in, and you can see where the hairs were. And actually, I find that uh, missing the cetal uh, these CD or these bristles makes it a little bit easier to identify some of these specimens because the cetal sockets are very distinct then and you can count individual hairs much more easily or at least where they were. So when you are trying to identify some of these species, you will find a map or a ketotastic map of where these hairs are. So that's what you're seeing on this bottom right here. This is a map of the thorax of a blowfly or these muscoid flies that tell you where all these different hairs are found. In most of your keys, you're going to find the cetal map. You're going to get to know it, you're going to get to love and or hate it. But it's the easiest way to identify flies. All right, so that brings us to the end of the very basic introduction of the flies. Let me know if you have any questions.